And we uh, are holding this webinar today to discuss updating the housing and shelter inventory in each one of our 220 plus programs throughout the Texas Balance of State. And uh, specifically uh, how you can help us gather that data and update that data for our reporting to HUD. So we want to be um, uh, cognizant of the time, so I'm going to leave everyone muted. Um, so if you have a question, please um, type in that question using the, the question box uh, that GoToWebinar provides. And then at the end of the presentation, we will unmute everyone so you can ask questions through your mic or telephone if you would like. So uh, today we're going to start with a welcome. And then I'll give a short description of what this is, you know, what we're uh, asking you to do here. And then Lindsay Marsh, our data coordinator, will lead us um, on uh, some examples or through some examples of entering data through an online survey. Uh, survey Monkey is what we'll be using uh, to collect this data for all of our housing and shelter type. Uh, programs. And then again, like I said, we will we'll provide time for a Q&A. If you have questions uh, throughout, please type those in and I will try to get to those as I can. A couple more things. This webinar is being recorded and we will take some summary notes. Um, so we will be able to provide those things to you. Those items, the recording, and the links to the surveys that we'll be uh, discussing will be up on our website uh, shortly after the meeting. So um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of the attendees, but I do want uh, everyone to see how uh, wide of a, a geographic area our registrants are covering. So you can see we have people from uh, attending this webinar all the way from Lubbock down to Brownsville, over to Texarkana, and then all the way west to Midland. So we've had good participation um, on this call, and I see people are still um, still showing up. So um, that's great. And we hope that you who are attending this call um, can bring this information back to your communities and back to the service providers and specifically housing and shelter providers in your community and encourage them to um, access this survey that Lindsay will go over later and enter the data that we need uh, to report to HUD and data that, as I'll um, describe in, in a little while, data that will be very helpful to you as a community. Okay. Let me go ahead and get started with the presentation. Okay, so this is um, updating the Texas Balance of State Housing and Shelter Inventory for 2015. So I thought the best way to uh, go through this for you and uh, describe for you what we're doing here is to go through the who, what, when, where, why, and how of this. So who's involved with this? Well, Texas Balance of State, Continuum of Care staff, um, me, uh, Lindsay Marshall, Data Coordinator, and Mary Dodson, our COC Manager, uh, will all be um, heavily involved, as well as probably other staff, and including our HMI support team. We also need the help of representatives from emergency shelters, transitional housing programs, permanent supportive housing programs, and rapid rehousing programs. And we're hoping that those attending this call represent uh, those groups, and those attending this call can be in contact with other representatives of those groups. So what is this? Well, this is a 
annual shelter and housing inventory update, um, as well as a point in time census uh, that we have to collect data for uh, on each program, emergency shelter, transitional housing, PSH, and rapid rehousing for everyone in the Texas Balance of State geographic area. That's a huge area. That's 216 counties, and like I said, that covers uh, over 220 programs and probably uh, that's an even higher number than that since we've added some uh, geographic areas. So um, we definitely need your help with this uh, huge task. So when is this happening? Well, as you know, our point in time survey is on January 22nd. Um, and that's an important day to remember, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. But this um, annual shelter and housing inventory is required to occur in January and at the end of the month in January. So the important thing to keep in mind is this is not the point in time survey that we're administering to people experiencing homelessness. These are two different um, initiatives. And uh, this, what we're talking about today, is focused strictly on the housing and shelter uh, facilities and programs that we have. This annual shelter and housing inventory will be open for um, data entry from January 15th through January 23rd. So providers will be able to go into the online survey and enter data on their programs during those dates. We wanted to open it up longer than just one day so you could go in and uh, begin entering your inventory data prior to the point in time count if you wish to do that. Now, the point in time census number that you will be entering for your program, and each program will have an individual entry, will need to uh, be for the data on January 22nd. So the number of people who stayed the night on January 22nd should be reported for the census uh, for that program. So where do you enter this data? We have a online survey that uh, Lindsay has created and it is through SurveyMonkey. And like I said, that will be on our website on the Balance of State Continuum of Care page of the THN website. Um, and these links will be emailed out to you. Lindsay will be going over these surveys in a few minutes. So why is it that uh, we have to do that this every year? Well, the first reason is this is mandated by HUD. Um, this is something that uh, each COC has to um, update every year and report to HUD through the homeless data exchange. Um, but this is also important for our continuum of care planning, uh, community needs gaps analysis, and for information and referral purposes. Um, so we're not doing this just to uh, meet the requirements of HUD. We're also doing this um, to help with our overall planning and to provide information uh, for those in need and also those that are delivering services. So how do we do this? Um, Lindsay is going to give us some examples of how to enter data through the Survey Monkey, and I am going to pass my screen to Lindsay. Okay, Lindsay, you should be getting that. Okay, um, let's see. Eric, you can see my screen, yes? Yes, I can. Hello, okay. All right, so here um, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go over the 
the emergency shelter inventory um, survey just because most people do have an emergency shelter. I can tell you that um, everything is pretty much the same for all of the surveys except for um, the rapid rehousing and we're going to go over the rapid rehousing as well um, just because that does have a, a couple of different questions on there and we don't want you to get tripped up on that if uh, any of you have um, rapid rehousing housing programs. But we're going to start, this is what your survey is going to look like. You're going to go into SurveyMonkey and again we're going to have that up on the website for you by tomorrow and we're also going to email that out to you as well. Okay, so just be on the lookout for that. Um, so let's go ahead and we are filling this out for an emergency shelter and I'm going to put my name in here and Let's see, um, we need the address if you represent a domestic violence a shelter or scattered site, you do not have to put an address in here. So just remember that it's written there. Um, so. Okay, so that has just filled everything out, um, but you'll need to go ahead and give us all of this information just in case, you know, we have to go back, we have to look at something, we want to get um, the phone number for you as well. So you just hit next and let's talk about the primary target population your shelter is designed to serve. That means at least 75 percent of your client base falls into this particular category. Okay, You can only have one primary target population. So because um, I want to show you what the different questions look like. We're going to go ahead and say that this emergency shelter targets single males and females as well as households with children. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Now, some people will have a secondary target population, so it could be domestic violence victims, uh, people with HIV AIDS, veterans, or not applicable. So. Um, it's not required that you have a secondary population. Um, you can go ahead and give that to us if you want, and Eric can answer more of your questions later um, about your secondary target population. Um, there's a question, so let me see. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and hit next. Okay. So let's go ahead and talk about this. Um, this is units, embeds, and you'll see up here, so dependent children, let's talk about, first of all, what a unit is. It's the overall structure holding places for people to sleep, okay? And so if you have a large auditorium with 20 cots, that means that's one unit, okay? One unit and 20 beds, because a bed is an actual bed where a person is able to sleep. So if you have a room within a shelter, with three physical beds in that one room, that means you have one unit and three beds. If you have a one bedroom apartment with one physical bed, that means you have one unit and one bed. If you have a two bedroom apartment with three physical beds, that actually means that you have one unit and three beds. Okay, so you need to let us know if you have any questions about the difference between a unit and a bed. So let's move on to the questions here. On a typical day at your facility, how many units are available for people in households with dependent children? Okay, so we need to, this isn't for the singles, this is for people in households with dependent children. So how many units do we have? Let's go ahead and say that there are four units available for people in households with dependent children. And on a typical day in your facility, how many beds are located within those four units? And let's just say that we have eight beds, okay? So obviously that would mean that there are two beds per unit. So then we'll go on to our next question. And so now we need to know how many people were actually occupying those units and beds on the night of January 22nd. So 
our next question is how many households with dependent children were staying with you on the night of January 22nd? And let's just say that there was only one household with dependent children staying with you. But now we need to know how many total people are accounted for within that household. And let's just say that we had three people, okay? Let's say there was um, a parent and two children. So three total people, okay? So let's go to next. Okay, so you can see up here that now we're talking about single folks because remember our emergency shelter caters to not only the single male and female but also this, those households with children. So we just took care of the households with children but now we're going on to the, um, the singles. So again, we have what uh, constitutes a unit, what, what constitutes a bed, and then we have some examples for you. So on a typical day at your facility, how many units are available for people in households without dependent children? So again, without dependent children, so that means singles. How many units are available? And let's say that we have eight units available. And on a typical day in, at this facility, how many beds are available for those people who are single? Let's say that we have eight beds available for those single people. So let's move on. So again, now we need to know how many people were actually occupying those units and beds on the night of January 22nd. So on that night, how many households without dependent children, so how many single people were staying with you on the night of February, or I'm sorry, January 22nd. And let's say that we had five singles, and, or five households. And so how many total people are accounted for in those households? Um, let's just go ahead and say that they were all actual single individuals, and let's just say that we had five people accounted for within those households. So let's go on to next. So here's where, if you have an emergency shelter, you might run into some questions. Did this shelter have any dedicated overflow beds available on the night of January 22nd? So did you have, have any overflow beds that were dedicated specifically to any overflow traffic you had? Not like, oh, well, we could potentially pull out some cots or something, but these are going to be beds that are actually dedicated to overflow beds. So did you have any available? Let's say that we do have some available. So how many fixed overflow beds did this shelter have available on that night? Well, let's say that we had two available on that night. Okay. So that's the, end of the sh that's the end of the survey. That's all you do. It's pretty straightforward. Now, I know we're going to want to go back and we're going to want to talk about those overflow beds. So hang on to your questions or put them into the question box, and we'll definitely get, those, get to those, and we'll talk about them out loud um, so everybody can, uh, can hear that. Um, next, let's go ahead and talk about rapid rehousing, and hopefully at least one of you has a rapid rehousing project. Um, so what we want to do, this is just the beginning. So let's go rapid rehousing. That's what we're aiming for here. Okay, so again, you're going to want to fill all of that information out. Okay, so for our target population for our rapid rehousing, um, Again, that's 75% of your client base. Let's say that it's single male and female. Let's just say that we don't have any secondary target population. Okay. So we want to, again, here's the units, here's the beds. We have some examples for you. How many units were available for people in households without dependent children on that night? And let's say for this rapid rehousing, let's, let's just go with five again. So how many beds were available for people in households without dependent children on that night? Let's go ahead and say that we add, let's just, let's do 10 beds. 
and let's hit next. Okay, so now we need to know how many people were occupying those units. So how many households without dependent children were staying in your rapid rehousing project on that night? Let's say that we had two households and how many total people were accounted for in those households. Let's say that we had four people accounted for in those households. There you go. So. Yeah, no, that's, that, looks, that looks great. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, actually plenty of time if you wanted to go through one other um, example. But before you do that, let me um, ask those in attendance if you have any questions. Um, I've only had one question typed in so far, and that is um, whether or not we will, we will be providing the links to the surveys. And uh, like we said, we will provide those on our website and uh, via email. Um, so uh, let me unmute everyone, and we'll try this. We'll see if there are any questions. Um, we might get a lot of feedback, so I might have to end up muting everyone again. Um, but let me go ahead and start unmuting everyone. So your mics will be unmuted unless you're muting them on your end. So if you have a question, just say, hey, I have a question, and then I'll recognize you, and you can ask it, and we'll do our best to answer. Hey, Eric. Yes. Uh, this is Keith Wallace. We operate both an emergency. Go ahead, Keith. Different locations. So will we fill out three questionnaires? Yes. There will be a questionnaire filled out for each program type. Okay. And they're pretty quick to go through. You I think after you get through the first one you'll 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 say, well this is pretty easy, it won't be hard to do the others. All right. And so the reason for that is, in case everyone is wondering, is because when we report this information to HUD, we have to report it in that manner. So each one of your programs will uh, be a row in our housing inventory chart. So um, if you were to type in Central Texas Sea Services Bureau, you might have three different programs under that one agency, and each one of those programs um, be a separate record, according to HUD. Okay, any other questions via mic or phone? Because there's a lot of those coming in typed. I'll, since there's not a whole lot of feedback, I'll just go ahead and start answering the ones that have come in. Uh, yeah, can you answer Andrea's uh, question, and um, and then I can definitely, after the questions are over, go through the uh, transitional. Sure, that that'll work. Thank you. Um, okay, so Andrea Wilson with Salvation, or I'm sorry, not Salvation Army anymore, with PATH in Tyler, has asked. Uh, well, she said we have a rapid rehousing program that is not tied to a specific inventory. So no idea on how to count these. Now this is um, this is confusing and it, it's it's a little odd the way we do this, but this is how HUD has um, said we will do it. For rapid rehousing projects, what we count for quote inventory uh, are the units and beds that are being used on the night of the count. Now you may have funding for uh, 20 units and 40 beds, but on that night you are only using that rapid rehousing funding to house people in 10 units and 20 beds. So what you would report is those 10 units and 20 beds. Okay, and um, there, she also, Andrea also asked if uh, Lindsay would go through the transitional housing, uh, and she will do that. And, okay, let's see. Sorry, I'm going to have to mute you all. And I know there are some questions. I, I just muted everyone. I'm sorry, there, there were some questions about why everyone's being muted, and it's just because we've been getting a lot of feedback. Um, 
Tony Hall with the VA asked, uh, when I said I received a point in time survey link, thanks will, to enter the actual PIT data, is this required to be completed? Um, the, yes, it is required of all housing and shelter programs uh, that serve people experiencing homelessness in the Texas balance of state continuum of care. We can provide a map of that geographic area if uh, you are unsure whether or not you fit within that. Linda Hamblin from Midland Fair Havens asks, after these are completed and compiled, will we have access to the data in a local report and statewide report? So there will be um, a report on the data collected on persons experiencing homelessness, uh, as always, uh, Lindsay will create that uh, tabular report for you. The housing inventory report, uh, we certainly can make that available by community. It's pretty easy. We could, um, in fact, I can put on our website uh, underneath the survey links the housing inventory chart from last year. And you can go in there, download that. It's an Excel form, and you can um, you can filter for your community. Um, so we'll put that up too, and you can use that. So the last day, there's a well, actually Craig, who's in the office, joining us, and thanks Craig for joining us and writing notes. He asked, when is the last date to submit surveys? And right now we have that set at January 23rd, the day after the. Um, an actual point in time a survey of persons experiencing homelessness. And finally, Beth Rawlingson with Advocacy Outreach in Bastrop asked if our ESG grant combines rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention, do we count those together or separate? Well, you just, for this, these purposes, you just count uh, the data on your rapid rehousing program because we're just looking at those housing and shelter programs. Okay, um, I am going to mute myself again, and hopefully I'll be able to find the unmute next time. Um, but uh, I'll let Lindsay go ahead and go through a transitional housing example, and then we'll ask answer a few more questions before we close out. Um, and just real quick, uh, yes, Michelle has a question. Did you say the last day to submit surveys to THN is uh, uh, January 23rd, yes, um, because we're really getting this, uh, your inventory for the night of the 22nd, so Right, so here, if you put down vets, you Lindsay. have to have beds that are specifically dedicated to veterans. Not this, this isn't a, a yes. You're going to have to start over with the transitional housing example. You had cut out early on, and the connection was just reestablished. Fantastic. Okay, <laughs> so we're going to go back. Hopefully everyone can hear me now. Um, so transitional housing, if you have a scattered site, 
or if you're a DB uh, facility, do not enter an address. So that's really the only difference for scattered sites. So let's go ahead and go to next. We'll say that our target population is for single males. And we're going to then look at um, putting down veterans for our secondary target population, OK? So the next question then is, how many beds do you have that are specifically dedicated to veterans? Now, I know that we all love veterans and that you know we are more than happy to house them. Um, however, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have beds that are specifically dedicated to them. So let's say that we have one bed that is specifically dedicated to veterans. So that means no matter what, that bed is always going to be occupied by a vet. So let's go on to next. So, um, so okay, well, I'm working out some bugs here. So this is great. I'm glad we did this. Um, this has dependent children, but we clearly marked that it was for um, for singles, so I am taking notes now um, to fix this. Skip logic in that. Sorry about that. Um, we had, I don't know, five people maybe go through our surveys, and it looks like we missed that one. So, um, so basically, it's really the same as the other ones. Lin if, Lindsay, yeah. one, sorry, I have to interrupt you again. Uh, can you make sure that your screen, it's, it's not showing your screen. There might be something oh, you have to goodness. click on on your side, I believe. Can you see my screen now? Not quite yet. Um, I'm going to make myself a presenter and then turn it back to you. OK. Okay, now I'm turning it back to you. Sorry, for everyone, for the technical difficulties. Okay, can you see my screen yes. now? Okay, so I'm just going to go back and, like I said, if you have a scattered site, don't enter an address. That's really the only difference there. Um, and I also mentioned that I found um, some faulty skip logic here, so I'm going to get that fixed. But let's just go ahead. Really, let's talk about um, if your secondary target population is vets. We want to go and we want to talk about how many beds that are specifically dedicated to veterans. So um, does anyone have any questions about whether or not you have specifically dedicated beds for veterans? Um, because I think that's really important. Um, and it, like I said, this isn't, oh, yes, we'd be more than happy to house veterans in, in our program. It's making sure that this bed is only for veterans. So does anyone have any questions about that? And Eric can probably shed a little bit more light on that as well, since this is my first time specifically working with the housing inventory. And, and I would just say I, we know of most programs that, out there that are dedicated for veterans. But if you do have a question, you know, ask us. Um, like Lindsay said before, basically your target population is based on whether or not that's your primary service population. Uh, or if you're at that 75 percent or more of your uh, service population on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, um, that's really all I have, um, Andrea. Uh, I know you're muted right now, but if you have any other questions regarding your scattered site, feel free to drop me a line, and you know we can work on that together. But um, Really, the only difference is, is that you don't need to put an address down. And that's not a required question, so it's not going to kick back to you or, or anything. So just don't put an address down. OK, thank you. Um, and again, sorry, everyone, for the technical problems. I think what uh, we'll, we'll do after this is uh, record some very short uh, webinars that we can put up that will um, quickly show someone how to go through the survey um, or just take a uh, portion of this and, and put that up. Um, 
So there have been a couple more questions that have come in. And uh, Lindsay, do you need the screen anymore? No, please take it back. <laughs> okay. Um, everyone should be seeing my screen now. So we had a question come in from Michelle Wormley, who is with Woman Inc. in Beaumont. Um, and I don't know if I'm going to interpret this question correctly, Michelle, so you may need help, and I can unmute you. Um, in fact, you know what, let me unmute you and you can just ask the question. Let me find you here. Okay, you're unmuted, Michelle. But you're, you're, you've muted, muted yourself on your end, so you'll need to unmute yourself. Okay, while uh, Michelle is doing that, um, there was another question that came in from Linda Hamlin. So she asked, so we could have a secondary population but not have dedicated beds for them. So um, your secondary population uh, would have um, dedicated beds or you would have dedicated slots, not, but you wouldn't have physical beds dedicated uh, uh, always. You would have uh, slots uh, for that secondary population. Um, I think one of the things that would help a lot of you who represent agencies that have been around for, um, you know, for a while is to look at the data from last year that we will be putting up on our website and uh, see how those questions have been answered uh, uh, last year. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answers you. Uh, Michelle, if you're ready to ask the question, you can unmute yourself. Okay, it must not be working. Um, oh, I'm sorry, and Linda, in your case, you definitely would list DV. Um, if you are a DV provider, uh, you you list that. Okay, uh, Michelle ask. All of our data will be entered by one agency after we submit them after the count on January twenty second. Do you expect that data to be entered, or do we just scan and send the surveys to THN? Okay, what she's talking about is the point in time survey of people experiencing homelessness. So um, that's separate from what we're talking about today, but that uh, is when the community goes out and uh, administers surveys to people in shelters and on the street. That data will be entered hopefully by your uh, point in time survey representative there uh, or by volunteers working with that person. And um, once that data is entered, uh, that goes to Lindsay. And we do expect that those representatives and communities keep those hard copies um, and then send those to us afterwards so we can find any mistakes that may have occurred during data entry. But again, this is separate from that. This is you just recording data on your program or programs. Okay, I'm going to keep the line open for any questions. Um, But I want to go to the next slide here. So the result of this, when you give us this data, we go into each uh, project or um, program uh, that is listed in our homeless data exchange with HUD. And uh, most of you are already listed. Uh, there will be a few new agencies that come, come on. Uh, but we will enter data like this. This is data that uh, the survey Lindsay has created will pull and we'll use that data to update this information for HUD. And each project or each program has their own page like this, the project inventory details. And the end result is there's a huge uh, spreadsheet put together that can be filtered by housing type or shelter type. And you can see a lot of questions are asked and this is uh, you know this is required by HUD this is used for um, 
assessing our continuum of care. Um, this is also this data is also used when we do the annual homeless assessment report. Um, so it's used within our continuum of care application. It's used in a, a variety of reports. So uh, this is important for our continuum of care. But again, I believe it's important for your community to have this information. And Eric, sorry if I can just jump in really quick. I think uh, Linda asked the question of whether or not this would be made public. And I think it's a really good idea that we, we can send you a list of the housing inventory within your area in case there there's maybe a new project coming up or maybe a small shelter that you just simply weren't aware of and maybe it's 60 miles from you but at least you could we could put you in contact with that those individuals and you could start making doing some networking and seeing how you all can work together and that's that's an excellent point and we, we will definitely do that um, yeah, I think that would be a, a big benefit to our communities. Um, yeah, this is this is a huge undertaking, and I just show this last picture to demonstrate how big it is. So that what you were looking at on this page, that is that data printed out. And this um, is why we all wear contacts or glasses. Right. That is that's standing a foot taller than I stand. Now I'm not that tall, but you know, six foot of spreadsheet data is quite a bit of data. So we definitely need your help to gather this data. Um, so you know, please uh, fill out the surveys and uh, send us that data as soon as possible. Okay, I am uh, going to open it up for other questions. Um, but after we answer the questions, uh, you know, um, that we can, uh, we will go ahead and close out because it's getting close to 11 and we want to be mindful of your time. Uh, Jean East uh, from um, Women's Shelter of East Texas asked, um, it would be great to see what each location entered last year to make sure that this year's inventory is entered in the same manner. So the data that we'll put up on our website, and we'll also email this to you, we'll show you what was entered last year. And I, I think Gene makes a really good point there because say, for, and I'm going to use Linda as an example, Linda, if she's starting to fill out this survey, um, you know, she may not know exactly how uh, she should list some of her program's uh, data. But if she has that inventory from last year, she can see exactly what was in her last year. And um, that will give her a really good guide on whether or not anything has changed. In a lot of cases, things haven't changed. So your inventory may be exactly the same. Your service population may be exactly the same. Uh, whether or not your program is covered by HMIS, that may, may remain the same. The only thing that may change and will, will change is what that point in time census is on the night of the 22nd. So for a lot of you, it's just verifying that the data is still correct and updating your point in time census. So uh, we'll definitely provide that information. OK, I'm going to leave the line open for any other questions. But in case you have to go ahead and, and get off, I'm going to uh, say thank you for joining us. and. Um, we'll provide you with a lot more information via email and on our website uh, starting tomorrow. So if you have to go, thank you very much and stay warm. Yes, thanks everyone. This is Lindsay. So please don't hesitate to drop me a line and if you